Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive at the City Club and also a proud member. It's April 10th, the fourth week of virtual forums at the City Club of Cleveland. And as we've taken to doing, we're presenting our Friday forum today from the studios of 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream, our public media partner. In the last few weeks, we've convened forums on the impact the pandemic is having on public health, on mental health, on state and local policy responses as well. And today we're focusing squarely on the enormous impact this global pandemic is having on the economy and what the United States Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, is doing, which you may have heard involves an additional $2.3 trillion in assistance to the economy. Dr. Loretta Mester is with us. She's our guest of, at our Friday Forum today. She's president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. We'll talk about the Fed's national response to the coronavirus outbreak, the economic outlook, how we will get the economy out of this coma at the appropriate time, and what we know about the economic impact in Northeast Ohio and across the state. As in every City Club forum, you can participate with your questions. You can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at the City Club, and we'll work them in. Dr. Mester took office at the Cleveland Fed on June 1st, 2014, as the 11th President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Dr. Mester, we are so glad to have you with us. Welcome back to the City Club. Thank you very much, Dan. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, and first, before we get started, how are you? How is your family? Everybody holding up? Yeah, we're all holding, hanging in there just like a lot of other people are doing. So uh, thanks for asking. And um, how are you doing? We're OK. Thank you very much for asking. Everybody's managing. But these are crazy times. Crazy enough to uh, command a $2.3 trillion response from you and your colleagues at the Federal Reserve Bank. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we've been doing a number of things um, to, to support the economy, um, working with, of course, the, the Treasury, U.S. Treasury as well. So, you know, first and foremost, you have to think about what's going on is this is a real serious public health issue, right, the pandemic. And uh, the doctors and scientists tell us that the best way to control the spread of the virus and to ensure that the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed is for us all to practice social distancing, staying away from people, not frequenting our usual haunts like stores and restaurants, working from home if that's possible. And so what that means is that the country, in the interest of public health, this investment in public health has shut down economic activity. And so that means that many households and businesses um, are really bearing the brunt of that shutdown. So they've been asked to make sacrifices in the interest of public health, just as we're asking the health caregivers um, to sacrifice a lot to ensure that people are able to get the best care possible. So when you think about what happened to the economy, if you go back to February, and it seems so long ago, doesn't it? But it it's does. only really a couple months ago, right? We were doing very well as an economy in February, uh, in, a, in a lot of dimensions. Um, and now we're shut down. So basically all activity really is shut down. And, and we're going to get very ugly economic numbers. We saw that last Friday in the employment report, which showed that the uh, country lost 700,000 jobs. We're going to see a contraction in output when the GDP report for the first quarter of the year comes out at the end of this month. Um, and really how long that shutdown uh, lasts is really going to depend on how the spread of the virus goes and the success of social distancing. And so for that, you know, we're listening to the healthcare experts and the scientists. But what public policy needs to do, and this includes the Fed, is to help ensure that the shutdown and activity that's being done in the interest of public health doesn't cause lasting damage to the economy, and to make sure that we give aid um, and relief to the employees, the workers, and the businesses that are bearing the brunt of that shutdown 
and from the Fed also making sure that the financial markets, which are very important conduits of funding to both households and businesses, stay stay up and running. Um, and I've always likened it to building a bridge, right? We had this good economy in February. We know at some point we'll get to the other side of the pandemic and activity will be able to resume. Um, and we just want to make sure that um, we have this bridge to get across that that shutdown period. So, right, the Fed's been doing a number of things. Um, first, you know, any bridge needs a good foundation, and the financial markets are a really important foundation for the entire economy, um, and they're very important for the global economy. And when we began to see stresses in the Treasury market, um, as everyone sort of pulled back from any kind of risk taking, um, the Fed went in and started buying treasuries um, and government mortgage-backed securities so that those markets would remain liquid. And then it also became apparent that other parts of the financial markets were also under significant stress. So we used our emergency powers to set up so-called 13-3 facilities, which are, um, they're called that because that's the section of the Fed Act, Federal Reserve Act that authorizes them um, with their approval of Treasury and backing, financial backing from the Treasury. Um, and, and some of these facilities are very similar to the facilities that we used during the financial crisis um, a little over 10 years ago. So, you know, we've offered some programs um, that are geared to making sure that the money market mutual funds stay healthy. Um, and liquid to make sure that um, credit can flow um, to smaller businesses, to household-backed um, securities like student loans. We're accepting some of that debt. So that's one set of programs we've been doing. Um, another set of actions we've taken are to relax some of the regulatory requirements on the banks so that they have greater capacity to lend through the shutdown period. And that means that we're encouraging them to come to, into our discount window and borrow funding so they are liquid, so they can lend to their customers. Um, and so those are our programs where we're trying to make sure that the markets work. Um, we've, we've also allowed, we've done some actions to, to help our central bank counterparties get access to funding in dollars because the U.S. dollar is such an important currency for a lot of activity. The announcement from yesterday that you referred to um, are, are more directly helping um, Main Street businesses, so both small and medium-sized businesses who are really being stressed by this period, and, and of course, their workers as well. So one of the programs we're doing is um, helping to support liquidity in one of, the, uh, one of the programs, the Paycheck Protection Program that the SBA and the Treasury Department set up that gets lending to small businesses. Um, and we're, we're taking some of that, um, those loans as collateral. So again, that the banks are able to do more of that lending under that program. The main so, so does that mean, program, sorry to interrupt, but does that yeah, mean that okay. as the banks are issuing those loans, the Fed is buying those loans? Yeah, essentially, essentially. they can pledge them as collateral to the Fed, and that mm -hmm. way they're able to get them off of their books and they're onto the books of the Fed. And of course, this is backed by um, funding that we, some of the funding that we've gotten from Treasury when they set up um, um, some of those programs in the CARE Act to, to take on some of that risk. Um, the Main Street program is really geared at um, businesses that are somewhat larger than the Paycheck Protection uh, Program businesses are. And, and that's really another program, um, a 13-3 program, um, that ensures that small and mid-sized businesses um, are able to get funding to get over this time, this, this, this sort of pandemic shutdown period, if you will. Um, and that program is going to offer four-year loans to companies that employ up to 10,000 workers, so um, bigger than the 500 workers that are covered under the um, PPP uh, program with revenues of less than $2.5 billion. And that's going to have a deferral principal and interest for a year. So again, um, and that involves... eligible banks can participate in that program, and they retain a 5% share of the loan, uh -huh. um, and then we take the rest of the loan. And there is also a portion of this new this two point three trillion dollars uh, that is involves the bank lending directly to businesses, not using banks as intermediaries. 
Yeah, so that's one, one thing that uh, is part of that program. Um, right now, it's focused on banks, but it could be non-banks as well. Um, and so, and there's no restriction on banks. If you've taken out a PPP, you can also take out a Main Street loan. So again, this is trying to support further credit flow to households and businesses. Um, and the other thing that might be very interesting to your, re, re, uh, to your listeners is the municipal liquidity facility. So it's very true that state and local governments um, are bearing the brunt on this with the shutdown and activity. Um, they're, they're having difficulties managing their cash flow, um, and that's under pressure. And so this facility is one that um, allow, you know, gives a lending facility to them so they can basically put some of their um, short-term notes um, to, into this facility and, again, get some cash flow that they're not able to get because of the shutdown of the government so that they can continue to serve their households and businesses. When it comes to municipalities, uh, how concerned are you and your colleagues around the country about the future tax revenue shortfalls that will that municipalities will undoubtedly face and state governments will undoubtedly face next year? Yeah, so I think that's a, a really good um, question and I you know I certainly we're certainly look in terms of just make, making sure that the municipal bond markets stay stay working um, which is our responsibility um, but I do think that with the brunt of um, you know fighting the virus has really fallen a lot of it on the states and ensuring that um, you know households and small businesses can stay afloat during this period I think they are going to need some further aid but that would be a decision of the U.S. Treasury, not of the Federal Reserve. Dr. Loretta Mester is our Friday Forum guest here at the City Club of Cleveland, broadcasting from the studios of WCPN IdeaStream. Um, Dr. Mester, uh, during the 2008 crisis, you were a chief economist at the Philly Fed and uh, were close to many of the conversations that created the um, the the bailouts and the quantitative easing and other pa- and other policies that the Fed rolled out at the time. How different is this moment than to that moment? Yeah, so there's some similarities. The similarities are that within the Federal Reserve, this really is a period of all hands on deck. Everyone is working um, as you know fast as we can, gathering information. You know, we at the Cleveland Fed, you know, we've really mobilized all our forces to gather reconnaissance from bankers and businesses and households and community development groups. Um, really, so we can understand uh, where things where things are, and so I liken this sort of like if we're thinking about the aid that we're giving um, both at the federal government level and the Federal Reserve as building the bridge. We're looking for gaps in the bridge um, to understand where other places are that are feeling the pain, and, and thinking creatively about what we can do um, with the tools available at the Federal Reserve to make sure that our bridge is sound. Um, and, and will get us to the over, over to the other side. So that all hands on deck, everyone knowing that, you know, we have an important role that we can play here um, to help the economy and households and small businesses and medium-sized businesses and large businesses get over um, that period. I think that's very similar. The nature of the, of the shock to the economy is different um, in the sense that we came into this, you know, back in February with really a pretty good economy. We had, you know, low, very low, historically low unemployment. Um, Firms were positive about the outlook. Um, So we had a good foundation. And that's different in the sense that, right, back in 2008, it was really this crumbling of the financial system and a, you know, dire, you know, period there that, that lasted much longer. Um, this is different because we've engineered this shutdown in activity. And so now the goal is let's make sure that the, we are able to do public policy so that we aren't doing lasting damage to that foundation so that we do get to the other side of the pandemic and activity does start to come back, right? We can have as good a recovery as possible given the situation. So it's a little bit different in that respect. Um, But it also is more hopeful in the sense that if we do, if everyone does their job right um, in making sure that we are, you know, making sure that we have as help and relief, right, to the economy and to the actors in the economy, the households, 
uh, the businesses, that the healthcare workers are able to do their thing to make sure that we get the virus under control, that we all practice social distancing so that we don't get um, our healthcare system overwhelmed. Um, then when we do are able to reopen, you know, then people can have confidence that you know we can handle um, the healthcare situation and resume business. And so we have a chance of getting things back on a, on a good path. If you have questions for Dr. Mester that you'd like to send us, you can tweet them at the City Club or you can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794 to text your question for Dr. Loretta Mester. She's president and CEO of the Cleveland, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, also known as the Cleveland Fed. Dr. Mester, this, uh, there's been a really interesting and healthy debate about whether or not this crisis lends credence to the argument that trade protectionists make, that uh, we would all be safer if we closed our borders, if we were completely self-sufficient as in, as in a, a sort of insular economy. How do you and your colleagues uh, at the Federal Reserve think about that? So I understand why that seems to be um, being talked about now. I guess I look at it a little bit differently. I guess one of the things that I think the lesson here is, is that you have to be thinking about tail risk. Okay, so there's efficiencies gained by how you, you know, by global trade. We know that in all the models, and we've seen it in countries that open trade is actually good because you can, you know, f specialize in what you're good at, you know, you can source things. But I think you also have to now, with this kind of situation, take a step back and say, well, but diversification of your supply chains, to, to the extent you can do it, may also provide benefits in times like this. And so I think there will be um, a rethinking about that trade-off between efficiency, um, where efficiency in normal times versus you know preparing yourself for things that may be at one point were thought unfathomable, but having lived through it, you understand. So think back to 2008, right? One of the big lessons there was, wow, we really should make sure that our banking system is well capitalized, um, that it has liquidity, um, so that when things happen, when there are shocks, they're able to continue lending um, through bad periods. And so I think that was a lesson, and I would liken that to this, right? There's going to be a lot of rethinking about can we do things that ensure that um, we're, we're saving for a rainy day or saving for something that we might not think of or setting up our business um, processes and our supply chain so that we have a little bit more resiliency um, if you get a shock. Now, of course, this one is so huge yeah. that it would be hard to argue that anyone could have prepared for this. But I think there are things that we can do um, in terms of thinking about our, you know, health care, protective equipment, et cetera, to be better prepared for something coming in the future. That's a, you sort of think about supply chains in terms of their national security impact. Right. There's a difference between a supply chain for T-shirts than a supply chain for personal protective equipment. Right. Um, exactly. The uh, you mentioned how well capitalized the banks are, and um, given the way in which markets are regulated and financial markets are regulated post 2008, they do seem to be better prepared to serve to continue to be a part of the bridge that you've talked about. What about the rest of corporate America? Given how well the economy was doing, it was, um, I think, dispiriting to some to see how many corporate balance sheets were over leveraged uh, as a result of stock buybacks and so forth. Well, so, you know, the Federal Reserve has, um, a, you know, we do look at um, financial stability broadly defined. And one of the things that we have been pointing out is that um, in the non financial business sector, um, there were um, signs that there's a lot of leverage in that in that sector. So, yes, and, and it was pointed out. Um, we were pointing that out in our financial stability reports that this was an area that we were we were engaged in looking in um, more carefully. So, 
you know, we pointed out there were risks there, um, and I and I do think it's one of the concerns, and that's also why you know we're also making sure that when we do these financial stability reports, we don't just look at one sector, but we look kind of broadly across the economy. So. I don't dispute that, you know, there were signs that there might have been excess leverage in certain parts of um, the economy, um, but a lot of those firms, right, made those decisions, um, and now with this pandemic, it's hard to argue that that was the cause of the fallout we're seeing now. This really is being driven by the fact that the right thing to do from a public health standpoint um, is to social distance it, stay in place, um, and that is having this huge impact. Unfortunately, the impact is being borne by probably the most vulnerable part of the economy, right? The, the restaurants and other workers um, that are losing their jobs because of the shutdown. And so, you know, I think both the Treasury and their programs and the Fed certainly, we really are focused on making sure that we're doing all we can to shore up that part of the economy. So, you know, the small businesses, the medium-sized businesses, the workers who are not with jobs right now, um, the PPP program focuses on making sure that um, firms to get the debt forgiveness have to keep their payrolls intact, so, and workers employed. So, you know, I think this is, it's, there'll be time on the other side of this to think about things we could have done better and things that we, should be thinking about for the future. But right now, this is about building a sound bridge. The longer the shutdown goes on, the wider the bridge has to get because more firms and more people are going to be affected by it negatively. Um, and the longer the bridge has to go, because as you know, the things have turned, you know, in terms of flattening the curve, it means that we have to be under the shutdown somewhat longer. So this is about building a good bridge so when we get to the other side, the economy is in, in a pretty good place to then start recovering. Dr. Mester, when you talk about uh, worker protections and, and paying attention to, to the needs of workers and the most vulnerable, one of the threads of conversation that I find most compelling happening right now is that on the other side of this, when we get to the other end of the bridge, there will be some opportunities to remake the economy in some ways and perhaps do so in ways that will make our economy more uh, more just, more equitable. How do you and your colleagues at the Fed think about that and plan for that? Well, you know, certainly we have a large um, function within the Federal Reserve System. Uh, we call it the community development function. And they have been very actively engaged in, as part of our purview, right, to understand um, the economic issues and uh, financial issues that affect low and moderate income communities and people. And so that work has gone on for over 30 years um, at the Federal Reserve. And of course, one of the big issues there is um, income inequality, um, disparate access to credit, um, depending on location um, and gender and race race. Um, so there's an active research agenda there. And that part, and part of the focus of that research agenda is on trying to come up with public policies, not necessarily policies that the Federal Reserve can enact, but really informing the policymakers that are responsible for that part of um, public policy of what can work and what can't work. So there's very active research going on within the Federal Reserve system, even though we're not the public policy group that can actually affect those, pro make those policies. And you're right, income inequality is something that um, has been around for, for too, way too long. Um, and, you know, what we are, we're trying to do is make sure that um, from the point of view of the Fed is that if you're in a low and moderate income area um, or if you're in a disadvantaged group that you can get access to credit um, um, for, for your activities. Um, making sure that it's a level playing field in terms of that is something that we can do. Um, we work with our banks to make sure that they're lending in those areas. Um, and we also are working to make sure that um, places, you know, and foundations and other um, groups that have a need for funding 
and banks that are looking for those kind of activities to fund can, can link themselves up. So there's a, pro, a program called Investment Connection um, that the Cleveland Fed is, is involved in, which actually does that kind of, fosters that kind of matching. So there are things that we are doing um, to try to make sure that we, there is access to credit um, that can help. In a few moments, we'll transition to the Q&A with Dr. Loretta Mester. You can text your questions to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at the City Club, and we'll work them in. Uh, Dr. Mester, pulling back the camera for a second to take in the entire globe, have you? how have you felt about the responses from the central, central banks uh, around the world, and in particular, the European Union yesterday or two days ago, I believe, announced uh, about half a trillion in stimulus and recovery policy, um, which presumably is to, meant to complement the work of the central banks of the various member states of the EU. Do you believe that enough is being done? Well, I think, you know, this is a huge public, global public health problem, right? And so what you've seen is you know, depending on when the virus hit their country and it, it, the path of it, right, countries have all looked at, you know, this is a serious, serious situation and have taken various actions. And so I think the central banks are um, taking appropriate action. I think, you know, we can, we're all trying to scale things so that we know, you know, we're all looking for gaps, right? We're all looking for things that we can do um, to help ensure that, um, the economy isn't, isn't damaged in a permanent way from this. And so, you know, each country has, you know, different tools available and different um, situations in terms of the virus. But I think it's definitely true that this is really one of these all hands on deck. Everyone is recognizing that this is a global situation um, and everyone's trying to do the right thing by, um, by their people. And so, we're going to learn from some of the things they're doing. They hopefully can learn from some of the things we're doing. Um, and so I know at the Fed, you know, we're not, we're likely not done. We're always looking for things where if we have the tool to be able to do it, um, and it, we think it, it's, it's needed, we're going to do it. And so I think that's the same thing going on at other, in other countries, at other central banks. If you'd like to join our conversation with Dr. Loretta Mester, President and CEO of the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank, text your question to 330-541-5794 or tweet your question at the City Club and we'll work it into the second half of our forum. You're with the City Club Friday Forum and uh, this question came in earlier. Uh, the Federal Reserve has now added 4.8, a total of $4.8 trillion in stimulus on the monetary policy side. Are you concerned that increase that this increases the record Fed balance sheet from about five trillion to almost ten trillion? And what are your thoughts on the effect that this size balance sheet will have for the future? So I I'm not that concerned about that. I what you know we set up these programs for a need. I mean there's a, you know, an urgent need um, to do what we could using our tools to first make sure that the financial markets are working. Right. We've seen in 2008 what happens when the financial system collapses. That would not be good for anyone. And so, you know, part of that was using our balance sheet to go in and make sure that the markets can continue to function. Um, and then part of it is are these emergency lending programs and they're emergency programs, meaning that when the time comes, right, when they're no longer needed, we will be um, you know, closing them whenever that time is the appropriate time. Obviously, we're not going to take them away if they're needed. So there'll be a time when that happens. Um, and until then, I think we're perfectly fine doing what we're doing in terms of the size of our balance sheet. This question comes in from uh, a member of the CFA Society of Cleveland, which is a partner to us on in putting this program together. When we originally, as you know, when we originally planned to host you at the uh, at a live in person City Club Forum, they were um, partners with us. And the yes. CFA member asks, uh, "How does the Fed think about the impact of their interventions on free market price discovery?" I have no idea what that means, by the way, so you're going to have to explain that one. Are there long-term risks from the Fed managing market prices for interest rates, repo rates, and the shape of the yield curve, et cetera? So please unpack okay. that a little bit for the non-economists okay. and non-chartered right. financial so, analysts among us. 
So I think that I would, I would uh, think that the thrust of the question is that we are going in um, and buying securities, backing securities, um, rather than letting the market do it. But I would submit the market wasn't doing it. The markets were totally disrupted. They were dysfunctional. Um, and so we needed to do these things to keep the markets you know, going and to keep them working. So we are, we are kind of ma making some of the market. But since those interventions, right, we have seen uh, much more improved uh, market functioning. In other words, it's more like the pricing has come back to be more to work. So I agree with the, you don't want the Fed to intervene in a way that doesn't allow the markets to work. But our interventions were at a time um, because the markets were, weren't working. And so I think that these are the uh, very appropriate things for the Federal Reserve to do. There's a question here about your vote on March 15th when the, um, when the Federal Open Markets Committee voted to reduce interest rates to almost zero, and you dissented and in a statement said that you wanted a smaller rate cut. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I dissented on the rate cut, but not on the actions right, that, affect, that were about the dysfunction in the financial markets, because frankly... That dysfunction in the financial markets, the financial markets are the conduit of policy rates through the rest of the economy. If the financial markets aren't working, then a rate cut is not going to have any effect. And so my argument was, look, we don't have the markets functioning right now, so any rate cut we do doesn't really have much impact at all. Um, we, I was in favor of 50 basis point cut. Um, as a support for all the actions that we were doing to help support the markets. And in fact, at that point, I would have, you know, even favored more to do um, to make sure that the, the dysfunction in the markets um, could be unwound. And so at that point, I thought, look, let's get the markets back working so that the, they're functioning enough and the transmission mechanism of monetary policy was working enough. And then right, given the outlook, cut again um, if and when it was necessary, when it would have a more, be more effective. But obviously different people had different views on that, um, and, and that's fine. That's kind of the great thing about the Federal Reserve is you can express your views um, around that FOMC table. And, you know, my, I totally respect my colleagues who had the opposite view that they wanted to just go all the way then rather than waiting until the functioning of the markets came back. Do you... How do you feel about how the markets are functioning with that rate cut in mind? Um, how dysfunctional are they right now? Yeah, so we've seen improvements across um, many of the markets. I, they're not back to what they were before, but I mean, I think that would probably be a heroic assumption is that the markets could be totally back given the uncertainties out there in the in the economy and, and the fact that, you know, a lot of um, firms really wanted to get into a cash rich position rather than, uh, you know, taking on risk. So there's definitely been an improvement. You've seen, um, you know, spreads, uh, liquidity, premiums come down. And, and so there is a, very much an improvement, um, if not back to where it was before. When you, it, I, I just want to ask you to clarify what you mean by markets functioning well and market improvement. You don't necessarily mean that the stock market is growing, that the Dow Jones is reaching a new peak every day. Right, exactly. So we're not we're not in the business of necessarily, you know, saying what the right price is. We just want to make sure that traders can trade. Um, that you know, if someone wants to sell his treasury. There's another side of the market. When the markets are dysfunctioning, you, you don't have anyone wanting to take the other side of the market. So there's no trading, and there's no whatever the price is. The mar you know, the traders are you know whatever they agree to in that trade, it's going to set the pricing. We're not, we don't care about that. We just want to make sure there's enough liquidity in the market so that those trades can happen. Another question here, and again, if you want to text your question, you can text it to 330-541-5794 or tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the to this Q&A here. The, the number to text your question again is 330-541-5794. Question about workers here. I understand that the Federal Reserve provides indirect support to workers by keeping businesses and banks open, but is there direct support being provided to households from the Fed? Will people simply be more indebted after this crisis? So some of the, okay, so the, let's take, for example, the, um, 
that's it's a good point in the sense that we do not at the Fed do direct grants um, to workers or to businesses, right? The Treasury's we, we taking are, that on are, this, this month, though. right? Exactly, and that's their role, right? So we're we're our role at the Fed is really lending, right, and making sure that there's a wherewithal, but we're aiding and aiding the Treasury, for example, in the in the payroll protection program by allowing you know banks to get some of that those loans off of their books so they can continue to make those loans and we're allowing you know we're actually encouraging banks um, to work with their customers to defer some of the loan payments um, so we're playing a role there but we are not permitted to lend directly to households or directly to businesses are but you we're worried doing a supporting role so that treasury we're is the pers- is the group that does have that power can do some of those programs. Dr. Messer, how worried are you about the increase in consumer financial debt? I think that, you know, again, this is one of these situations where we look at that um, student debt. There's a lot of s- things that we, we look at. But in this situation, right, this is really about getting people the wherewithal, the cash flow, so that they can stay afloat during this economic shutdown. So there will, you know, we've lowered interest rates to help alleviate some of that debt burden. Um, in the new loans that they do take on, they'll be at low interest rates. Um, the Treasury um, is offering direct payments. They've extended the, U- the unemployment benefits um, during the pandemic. Um, period of shutdown. So, you know, again, we all have to think very hard and creatively and work together to make sure that um, the households of workers um, and the smaller businesses and the others that are really bearing the brunt of this, right, can get through it so that they are in a position on the other side to resume activity. And some of it's going to be about confidence, too. It's, it's going to be how financially able they are to resume activity and also how confident we are that um, the virus is under control, that we feel that we can go out again um, without the fear um, that's plaguing us now. And that's why I think it will take some time for that to happen. Another question here. On the one hand, it seems like deflation is a grave worry as consumer demand collapses. On the other hand, stagflation seems like a worry as supply chains get more and more taxed to deliver adequate supplies of certain goods. How do you think about those twin issues? Yeah, so right now, I, I, I guess I'm not concerned about um, inflation. I mean, I know that early on people were concerned like, well, um, because of the supply chain that we need to be worried about inflation. If anything, it would be deflation if, if everything is collapsing and, then you, and you're not able to pick back up. But again, I think of this as if, we, if everyone does their um, best, right, including the Treasury, the Fed, Right, um, healthcare experts. If we all, the city um, and and state governments, if we all play our role um, and work together, then right, we can get back once the shutdown. Right, and the healthcare experts say, okay, we can start thinking about coming back and resuming some activity. We can come back in, in a way that then the economy can pick back up. But this is all right now about making sure that. Um, everyone to the best possible can survive this shutdown period and then on the other side of that be in a position for when activity resumes that the recovery is as strong as it can be given the experience we've just all been through. An interesting question uh, about sort of hearkening back to your comment before about the Federal Open Markets Committee and the environment there for sort of free-flowing discourse and disagreement. In September of 2019, your colleague James Ballard of the St. Louis Fed said that the Fed cannot rely on the same models and the Federal Open Market Committee needs to change their thinking. What's your interpretation of that statement? So, I, you know, this is a good example because, you know, everyone is trying to forecast what the recovery will look like right now. And so you have some people arguing that it could be a V-shaped, you know, you just, we come back and we, because of the nature, right, we can just resume activity. And other people are saying, no, it's U-shaped. It could be a very, very long-lived um, downturn. And I think the struggle here, and these are all very, very I suppose it could smart, also be W-shaped economists. if we wind yeah, up with a W-shaped, second wave. Uh, Right. Yeah, it could be all different kinds of kinds of shapes. And I think 
why there's such a disparate view is precisely because um, we haven't had something like this before. So if you're using the models that are typical models that you think of in terms of recessions, right, you would say, wow, this could be really long lasting. We're going to have like very negative numbers um, in the second quarter. I mean, just think of how high unemployment could get and how low you know, the cut in uh, activity will be and output will be in the GDP report. And if you take that on board and you were using your traditional models, that would say this could be very long lasting. On the other hand, that's not the situation we're in because we kind of engineered the shutdown. It wasn't that the fundamentals in the economy deteriorated so much that all activity stopped. It was we, we, we basically wanted activity to stop to handle the health care issue. And so Right. Those who argue that it could be a V are basing it on that. Oh, when we as soon as we say go back to work, everyone will be back to work. My own view is that it's going to be in between. But I think it illustrates that just because something in the past was one way, that doesn't mean that this situation is the same. We haven't. This is an unprecedented situation. We haven't ever lived through anything like this before. Um, and we've never had a policy that, you know, a stay at home policy. It and does. so I think. We have to be thinking, um, I know this was, Jim wasn't thinking about this when he made those statements before, but the point is, is that it's a difficult time to forecast and we just have to be, um, we have to understand that and we have to kind of move forward with what are the best policies can, that can make sure that whenever that time the healthcare people tell us it's time to come back, it's safe to come back. Um, whether it's staged, come back, you know, whatever the right path to come back is, we want the economy to be as strong as it can be so that the recovery can be as strong as it can be. It does seem perhaps overly simplistic to assume that it would be a U or a V or, you know, comparable to anything else. We're seeing in the public health world that um, there's competing models everywhere that are being revised on a daily basis. Are, is that the way you and your colleagues are approaching this as well? Definitely. I mean, we're definitely um, looking at multiple models and we're revising our models as new data comes in. So, you know, for example, early on. So we do a lot of, um, you know, talk a lot of business and consumer and other contexts, at, as we always do when we, you know, try to understand what's going on in our economy in the fourth district. And you could just see the change, um, you know, even like weekly or even less than weekly, even every couple of days, as the virus, you know, entered Ohio and became more uh, more widespread, you know, businesses that would tell you, oh, I think this will be fine. I have enough wherewithal to get through this. You know, they all then started reporting, okay, this is bigger than we thought and it's having a bigger impact and now I'm getting supply chain issues and et cetera. So just in terms of sort of recognizing the scale and the depth of this, um, it changes very quickly um, depending on what business you're in and what sector you're in. But I think everyone is, you know, always updating with the new, with new information, and it is a very quickly um, changing story. The here in Ohio, it seems as though the the economic impact has been driven probably now. Tell me if I'm wrong, but probably more by the robust public health response and government response than the virus itself? Oh, I think Ohio was uh, uh, early on, I mean, I give Governor DeWine and, comp and his, you know, the public health people here, and I'm on the board of the Cleveland Clinic, and I've been very impressed by their ability to do things in a very um, thoughtful but quick and urgent way. I think, you know, we were, we are like cited, Ohio is cited as one of the places that were early on um, and taking on board that this uh, social distancing and, you know, making sure that, you know, you're not exposing uh, people to the virus and being safe uh, has, and it's showing to be good for the state. I mean, so in that sense, you know, I think we are viewed as being one of the places that we're early in it on board. And th because of those actions, um, I think we're going to have a better outcome in terms of, of the virus. Another question from our audience. How might bailout lending prevent the inequities for entrepreneurs of color that existed prior to the crisis with regard to accessing capital? So, 
it's certainly something that um, we care about. Now, in the Fed, when we do our programs, right, we don't target any sector. In fact, by law, we're required to have them be a broad um, access and not targeted on one specific sector. So, you know, certainly um, our hope is that this funding gets to where it's needed. I mean, we certainly are examining whether I mean, we've heard the stories that banks obviously are focusing on their cu customers first in terms of getting the small business lending to them. So, you know, there's an active uh, role that our community development folks are playing on sort of making sure that um, smaller firms, firms that may not have had a banking relationship, that they're not left out of this either. And so identifying, you know, programs that can help them and making it easier for them to navigate through um, some of the complexities of accessing this funding um, is something that we're focused on. So our hope is um, that, you know, we're doing what we can do to make sure that um, there is some equitable uh, access to this kind of credit and help and relief. Dr. Mester, another question regarding access to capital. Are you and your colleagues at the Fed concerned about your partners in federal government who are tasked with getting the money out? There's been reports recently about the SBA being swamped by requests for funding that has been promised. Yeah, so the SB, that program, the PPP program, the SBA program, it certainly got off to a, a little bit of a rocky start. Um, and that sort of um, perhaps have been expected because it did get, you know, it's, we're all acting much quicker. And I would say the federal government as well is acting much quicker than, than we might be used to. And so, um, understandably that can result in, in some of those, um, glitches that we saw, uh, last Friday when the program was got. My understanding though, is that things have set it down. We're in co close contact with the banks in our district, um, monitoring how it's going with their, um, programs. I think one of the issues that um, we've heard w far and wide is that the funding is not enough. Um, and, and I would say that as the, the shutdown period goes longer, uh, that certainly is, is probably the case, that more is going to need to be done um, because there's not only going to be a longer period of shutdown than we thought at the beginning, um, it's also going to be more of the economy is affected um, the longer it goes on. So we need not only a longer bridge, but a wider bridge. So right now, I think um, the concern is um, making sure that it's, it's not underfunded. Um, and that's up to the Treasury Department and the Congress to make sure that um, there's adequate funding for those programs. Just to be clear about what you're saying there in terms of a longer bridge and a wider bridge, you think that borrowers are going to need more than just two and a half months worth of payroll, which is what's the, the sort of calculation for the Paycheck Protection Program, and that there's going to be a whole lot more borrowers because right now there may be small businesses or nonprofits who think, ah, oh, we can get through it, and a month from now they're going to think, oh, well, we really need that program. Right. And I think that's true because, and I'm not faulting um, the treasure on this, the timelines have expanded, right? I mean, I think when we went into this, a lot of us thought, like, it can't possibly last till May. It can't possibly, ma you know, last that long. And, of course, th it's all being driven by the nature of the virus and the path of the virus. So, you know, it's, it's sort of that's driving the timelines. And so it would be a mistake to reopen things before that virus is you know, under control and in, in, until we see the markers that tell the scientists tell us are the ones that we need to see, because um, you wouldn't want to have a resurgence and then have to go backwards. So the timelines are getting elongated, right? And so I think that does mean that um, we're just going to need to make sure that there's enough wherewithal so the economy, businesses, households can get through that longer period of shutdown so that they are prepared when things um, are able to open up again. Another question here from the community. Uh, if a company has access to capital, should the, its board be able to buy back stock or pay dividends as the Fed has allowed under bank stress tests? It seems that a lot of people in Washington have taken an, quote, uninformed view that buybacks are inherently reckless. So it is a condition of um, the CARES Act that um, firms do refrain from that. And partly it's because um, 
it's it's important that the firms right maintain their um, capital levels and retain earnings so that they are more more robust. So, you know, I think in times like this, emergency um, situations, I I think that's the right strategy um, to do. And so, you know, you, we are um, in an emergency situation, and so those kind of restrictions seem appropriate to me, even if during normal times, uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to restrict that, those kind of distributions. The argument against stock buybacks is that they sort of inorganically uh, raise the, cre- cre- inorganically raise the price of the share, right? That it's not really underlying value there, just a sort of manufactured scarcity. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Well, I think it's up to the firm, you know, and the manage, you know, owners of the firm to decide kind of what their structure wants to be and how they want to distribute retained earnings, retain earnings or distribute earnings or buy back their strike. That, that's a capital um, structure uh, decision. And in the U.S., we typically don't intervene in those kind of, 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 the, of decisions. We allow the, the firms to make those decisions. Um, but we're not in that situation right now. We're in an emergency situation, and, and putting restrictions on that um, as a condition for getting some of this funding doesn't seem um, doesn't seem counter to the way you know a, a normal period where we would we might not want to do those kind of uh, restrictions. But but those are hard issues because you know when Congress talks about those kind of things in normal times, it also has to do with some of the issues you talked about before, which is um, owners versus workers and, and making sure that the distributions there are, are considered to be fair and equitable. And so that's a whole other dis- discussion that's independent of sort of this emergency period that we're in right now. In terms of, here's a question, it's a very Cleveland sort of question. Uh, will the Cleveland Fed update their report, which focused on the economic and workforce impact of increasing investment in public transportation in greater Cleveland? And this is connected to that bigger question of, when we get to the other side of this, how do you get people back to work and grow and do workforce development if there aren't enough jobs? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question because the Cleveland Fed has been um, doing a lot of work on uh, how do you get, you know, first on sort of quality of work in terms of the jobs and we call them occupation, um, opportunity occupations, meaning that jobs that are going to be jobs of the future that pay well um, above the median wage and also don't necessarily mean that you have to have a four-year degree. But that's one sector. That the other thing that we've learned in our, in our work is that there are a lot of other things about how do you keep a job, how do you get, you know, get to a job, um, and that transportation issue has loomed large um, in a lot of places. It, it, in some places, it's not that the worker doesn't have the skills. The worker has the skills. It just, the worker just can't get to where the jobs are. And so Cleveland, the Cleveland Fed staff has been doing work on that. And we will continue to do work on um, transportation and the importance of thinking hard about um, where even jobs are located and how workers are supposed to be able to get to those jobs and public policies, including public transportation, that can help. When uh, the public health experts in the hospitals declare that it is okay to begin reopening the economy in stages, how do you, what's the first stage of reopening an economy? Well, given that's that we've never really that, done this before. No, I know. <laughs> that's something that a lot of uh, people are thinking about because I would say everyone would like to get back to work as soon as we can, right? I think that it's a kind of a common goal that we, we, we really want to be able to get to work. But of course, we want to get to work when it's safe um, to do so. And so, right, we're going to be dependent on the scientists and the healthcare um, experts to tell us what they need to see in terms of statistics on the virus and number of cases and how long will you have to see um, decreases in the number of cases before you can get back to work. And then I think getting back to work is not just, okay, great, clap your hands and we're all going back to where it was before. It's going to be a thoughtful way of coming back, probably in stages, probably um, making sure that people do continue to practice being safe in terms of distancing and making sure that they have protective um, covering on their faces when they're outside. And so that 
it's sort of intelligent reopening or, you know, w whatever that looks like. We're all trying to think hard about, you know, that public health people are working on what are the criteria to know that we can come back and we can revitalize the economy. That's a conversation I'm looking forward to when we can have it in a public manner. Dr. Loretta Mesters, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mester. Thank you very much for uh, having me on and, and thank the whole Cleveland uh, community for working hard um, to make sure that everyone's safe um, and that we can all get through this together. Well, big thanks to you and your colleagues as well. She joined us as uh, part of these virtual forums, which are presented uh, in partnership with our friends at Ideastream. City Club virtual forums are sponsored by the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gund Foundation, KeyBank Nordson, and PNC, with additional support from Bank of America, the Center for Community Solutions, and St. Luke's Foundation. Special thanks today to Thompson Hine, who joined our City Club Virtual Forum sponsors this week, and many more generous members, sponsors, and donors who are listed on our website at cityclub.org slash thank you. We'd also like to thank CFA Society of Cleveland, a community partner on our forum today. We certainly appreciate your partnership and support. And we're going to continue to present virtual forums throughout this time, either here or uh, on our uh, online. Next Friday, April 17th, join us with, for a conversation with Dr. Yasha Monk about how the coronavirus is impacting the future of democracy here and around the world. If you have other ideas about topics or speakers we should feature while we all learn to shelter in place, please get in touch. We're at cityclub.org. I'm Dan Malthrop. Stay strong, stay healthy, and stay close in your hearts if you can't be close in person. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on Ideastream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.